A little pitch. Barkley looking for a seam. Great cut. Saquon Barkley in for the touchdown. No, don't like that. Jones going in to call for the touchdown. No, don't like that. Fourth and eight. Game on the line. Cousins, Hawkinson. He is not going to get there. No, don't like that. Hey, everybody. He's Snake Pliskin. He's the Duke of Minneapolis. He's Maggie. I'm the brain. Just one thing right now. Don't call me Harold. This ain't Escape from New York. But this is Viking Support with Drew, Ted, and Chris, and we are back in studio, baby, just in time for week one. Escape from New York. You go in, find the president, bring him out in 24 hours, and you're a free man. What if I'm a little late? And no more snake plissken. When I get back, I'm gonna kill you. Gentlemen, how are you? Chris, what's going on, brother? We are doing great. Uh, first, uh, first studio show of the new season. It's going to be uh, spectacular, I think. Talk about the uh, the New York Football Giants and our uh, Minnesota Vikings because we have finally freaking made it to Week One of the 2024 NFL season. I can't hear you. And I got a limousine sitting out there a mile long with 25 women just died for me to go. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite movies of all time, guys. Right up there with Alien. Right up there with 1981. I was 15 years old. When that movie came out, I told my ma, I said, Ma, I'm going to be Snake Plissken. I thought you wanted to be Fran Tarkinen. No, I want to be Snake Plissken. <laughs> okay, go be Snake Plissken. Well, you know, at least at least your mom didn't kill your dreams when you were eight. Like when my dad said, son, you'll never be Chuck Foreman. So, you know. Yeah, I was going to be either Charlton Heston or I was going to be Fran Tarkinen. Or I was going to be Snake Plissken. S.D. Plissken. American, Lieutenant, Special Forces Unit, Black Light. Two Purple Hearts, Leningrad and Siberia. Youngest man to be decorated by the President. He robbed the Federal Reserve Depository. Life sentence, New York Maximum Security Penitentiary. Did any of them pan out? Uh, no, nothing did. Um, <laughs> and I said I was going to be a bass player for Led Zeppelin. So nothing panned out, but I'm here with you guys to talk some football. So, you know, it didn't work out so bad. Chris, well, who did you want to be when you grew up? I, I really can't remember that far back, to be honest. I mean, I, I watched, uh, watched a lot of baseball. I mean, probably Kirby Puckett or somebody like that, watching all those uh, Twins games over the years when they were terrible. I mean, probably something along those lines. I was I was more into baseball than I was into football when I was real little, but that, really? uh, that shifted uh, as I got a little bit older. So, yeah. When I was 10, I wanted to be Fran Tarkenden. But when I was 15, Escape from New York came out. And I saw Adrian Borbeau. I wanted to be Snake Plissken. He got in somehow. Yeah. Yeah, but how? I can't blame you there. That, that's pretty. That's pretty persuasive. You got to give her two shout outs. Two shout outs for Adrian Borbeau. <laughs> Ruby, are you out there? Hello. Hi. Two chairs. Hi, Dances. Hi. Who who did you want to be when you were when you were growing up? Anybody in particular? Probably Madonna or Cindy Lauper. You might. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can see that. I was around that age at that time. So did you just want to have fun growing up? I guess. Go on, have fun. Or want to be a material girl? <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> How have you been? It's been a long time since we've been in studio. I have spent the last hour of my life rethinking everything. Once I okay. saw Drew. Get dressed up for the show today. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I'm excited, finally. It's about time, yeah. About time we're back at studio. Good to be back. Should I keep the Snake Plissken stuff on after the show? No. Oh, Snake Plissken in my cap? <laughs> Wait till I tell any. No, God, please, no. 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 That was pretty definitive. Just a quick shout out. Star studded cast, Ted. Borbo, of course, Kurt Russell. Isaac Hayes is the dude. Yeah. Ernie Borgnine. One thing about all those science fiction movies made in the 1970s, they were all filmed set in like the 1980s 90s. and 1990s, like long after the time has come and gone. So like New York is now supposed to be a maximum, the only maximum security prison left in the United States. 
And Drew and I were talking uh, before we, we went on here, because I was reading up on the movie to learn a little bit more about it before we did this today. Apparently the uh, female narrator at the beginning of the film there uh, is an uncredited Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah. who I know is a uh, favorite. Really? Attention, you are now entering the debarkation area. No talking, no smoking. Follow the orange line to the processing area. The next scheduled departure to the prison is in two hours. For as accurate as Wikipedia is, that's what Wikipedia says. So right. it was an uncredited role for uh, for Jamie Lee Curtis. So it's another future that's a great star that tidbit. in that movie. Tasty, tasty tidbit! And before we get started, what about a shout out to Ox Baker, Chris? The guy who Absolutely. fought Kurt Russell, Ox Baker, Ted? The great wrestler, yeah. Ox Baker? <laughs> yeah. So Escape from New York, which is what the Vikings will be trying to be do in a couple days. Before we get to that, we've got a couple things we want to talk about. Of course, Purple Pain Forms, our home on the internet, besides our YouTube channel. That's purplepainforms.com. Great community of Vikings fans. Head on over there, set up an account. That's purplepainforms.com. Start chatting with a great group and uh, a tight-knit community of smart, intelligent folks. Get away from the social media, Twitter, and Facebook pages of stupid, idiotic comments with the insults and all that crap. PurplePainForms.com. And then head on over to Daily Norseman. That's DailyNorseman.com, run by our very own Christopher Gates. He uh, he founded the site in 2006. He's still running it. SB Nation's own site, DailyNorseman.com. You can get everything you ever wanted to know about the Vikings, but we're afraid to ask. But they'll tell you anyways. Absolutely. DailyNorseman.com. Once again, as we start the 2024 season, we've got a couple contests going on. As always, it is a standard PPR scoring format. Every week this year, Drew, Chris, Ruby, and I will pick one quarterback, one running back, two wide receivers, and one tight end. Every week you will pick the team you think has the best chance of winning. Put your entry in the comments below here. Don't hit us up on our Facebook page. Don't hit us up on X or Twitter or whatever Elon Musk is calling it. Every time we pick a player, we can only pick that player one time throughout the course of the season. So it's done. So if we don't pick a player and that player gets hurt for the season, too bad for us. We can't use them. We don't know the picks beforehand when we send the picks in. And we don't pick the players that are playing on the Thursday night game because that might give one team that you folks might pick sort of an unfair advantage in case they go off and get like 40 or 50 points or whatever the case may be. The big change to this year. In years past, we've given you three points for first place, two points for second place, one point for third. This year, you get all the points that you would get in a standard PPR format week if you play fantasy football. So, for example, if you pick my team and I score 75 points in one week, and then you pick Chris's team and they score 75 points in week two, you have 150 points throughout two weeks. And that keeps going throughout the season. Conversely, if you pick, like, Drew's team and they only score 10 points, and then Ruby's team and they score, like, 300 points, Then you have 310 points. It gives you a chance to catch up if you kind of fall behind. Whereas in past seasons, if you weren't doing so well, it was kind of hard to catch up. So this year, you can kind of fall back in the pack pretty fast. So standard PPR scoring format all season, and you accrue points throughout the year. You can find the leaderboard throughout the season on VikingsReport.com. Ruby will keep that updated for us. And we've got a really awesome prize for our grand prize winner this year. It is a Justin Jefferson jersey. Put it up on the board. For our championship. Second place is the nice Stefan Diggs Vikings jersey as well. contest that's going on is our Rook Dog Challenge. We've mentioned it on the live show a couple times. You just pick who you think is going to be the offensive and defensive rookie of the year. Ruby has set up a place over on vikingsreport.com. Just put in who you think is going to be the NFL's offensive and defensive rookie of the year. You have to have that in by the noon central time kickoff. So we'll let you slide through the Thursday and Friday games, but if you don't have your picks in by the noon central time kickoff games on Sunday, you're out of luck. So Put in who you think is going to be the 
Offensive and Defensive Rookie of the Year over on VR.com. And what's the prize again this year? I can never remember the money number, Drew. 175 Yeah. 175 $175. No hollas to the winner. <laughs> Terrible imitation. It's like if you ordered if you ordered steak Pliskin on Timu. <laughs> I'd be like worm Pliskin. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. It was. Oh, but funny. My apologies. Yeah, but funny. That's all that matters. Lord, I apologize. Funny, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all right. We got Vikings news to cover. And we got a preview to include the return of the big board. And it's a three-person big board. Yes. Hell yeah. Hey, come on, baby. Come on. Yes. Come on. Ah! Yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but before we do, Drew, what time is it? Ted, I'm cooler than you are. So why don't you fix your little problem and light this candle? He's right. Going to New York City, find the president, and light this candle. He surely is. Let's light this candle. Yes! Resume the countdown! All right, I'm cooler than you are. Why don't you fix your little problems and light this candle? He's right. Let's light this candle. He surely is. Light the candle. Yes. Resume the countdown. Man, I missed that. I he missed that it. so much. He absolutely nailed it, too, by God. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah, we did. Gun All show. right. Gun show. <laughs> <laughs> You want to see Smith and Weston? <laughs> Maybe Red and Ryder. I don't know. Probably closer to that. Anyways, um, some Vikings news. Not too long after we did our most recent live show when we discussed the 53-man roster, all three of us were singing the praises of Jaron Hall and how he had a great preseason and deserved the third QB spot after J.J. McCarthy went out for the season with a torn meniscus. The Vikings promptly showed us how much we knew and cut him. And signed Brett Rippon. Just recently, he got picked up uh, and signed by the Seattle Super Seahawks and uh, signed to their practice squad. Kind of surprise move to me, Chris. Uh, how about you? Yeah, it really was. I mean, like we said in the previous shows, Jaron Hall looked kind of lost that first preseason game. Didn't look like he belonged on the roster. But then the last two preseason games, he really sort of pick things up a little bit. I know it's the third quarterback, and it's probably not something that's really worth getting super bent out of shape over, but I just don't understand the move at all. I mean, Hall showed a little bit of improvement. Rippon's been in the league four or five years, and he hasn't really given any sort of indication that he's actually good or anything. But I guess he's got some connections to Kevin O'Connell somewhere along the track, and that's good enough, I guess. But, uh, yeah, it's not a move that makes a whole lot of sense to me, to be quite honest. Drew? I think it backfired on him, Ted. I think they wanted to keep Hall. They got rid of Hall, got Rippin, and they were going to get Hall back in the practice squad and then get rid of Rippin. And I would have just kept Hall to begin with. Hall has more upside than Rippin does. I don't understand the move. I don't. I agree with you on the upside. I also agree with you on, I think their intent was to get Jaron Hall back on the practice squad. There was a press conference after the 53-man roster was set, or after, actually, they cut Jaron Hall, and it, it sure seemed like the intent was to get him to clear waivers and get him signed back to the practice squad. And, and over the Labor Day weekend, there was really no movement made. Whether they made an offer to him to come back to the Vikings, that hasn't been made public yet as of this recording. Maybe the, the Seahawks offered him more money. I, I, I don't know. But if that was their plan, it did indeed backfire, and he's now a member of Seattle. But like Chris said, at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about the third-string quarterback. When you look at it, as information started to come out on, on X or Twitter or whatever, Hall suffered a leg injury in that third preseason game. Not sure if he's going to be ready for week one. I probably didn't want to put him on IR. Brett Rippon has familiarity with the offensive system. He has worked with some of the offensive coaches in previous locations. And look, if you get down to whether it's Brett Rippon or Jaron Hall playing any significant, meaningful playing game time this year. Season's over matter. anyway. It doesn't matter. Pretty much. So, That's true. That's I mean, true. whatever. 
I mean, look what happened last year. I mean, those two games, Atlanta and New Orleans, that Josh Dobbs had were an anomaly. I mean, yep. what he did after that was more the rule, not the exception of Josh Dobbs' career. So. Is, either, is either guy going to do anything in the NFL? Probably not. But I'd at least like to give a chance to the guy who is progressing. Either one of those guys are taking snaps for your team, your season's in the toilet. Some other news that sort of hit Star Tribune columnist Mark Craig. Not really so much a beat writer anymore, but he's kind of hits the whole Minnesota sports scene. A track down former Vikings head coach Mike Zimmer, now the defensive back coach for the Dallas Cowboys, and interviewed him about his tenure, more specifically his last couple years with the Vikings. I don't know if you guys got to read the article or at least see significant parts of it, but what were your thoughts on that article and what Zim said about Spielman, a couple of the draft picks, a couple of his former players, et cetera, Drew? First off, who did a really good breakdown on this was Dave Stefano on the Two Old Blogger show last Sunday afternoon. He did a really, really good in-depth breakdown looking at both sides of it. I don't really understand why. I mean, is this one of those cases where a guy shows up and he's had like six drinks? Yeah, hey, I'll interview you. And he's <laughs> kind of buzzed and he goes off. I don't see what you're going to accomplish by all this. All it showed me was all the toxic stuff that Kendricks and everybody talked about. By him doing that interview like he did, that just solidifies that he did that. And that all that stuff in the past was true. I don't understand why you do it at this point, Ted. I mean... You're a defensive coordinator. You're on a new team. I mean, does it really bug you that much? I would think by the length of the column, it was uh, it was request, and it was uh, it seemed like a lengthy sit down. I mean, if you just look at the length, because a columnist generally in a in a newspaper these days doesn't have a whole lot of a words or length to work with, and this was a very lengthy article. It kind of came off as Zimmer basically declaring that. The Vikings' failures toward the end of his tenure were everyone's fault except his. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, exactly. I agree, 100%. The thing that kills me is that he talked about the relationship between him and Spielman toward the end. And they said, uh, I think it was, what was it, 2021, the year the Vikings had like four picks in the third round. And the first pick they made was Kellen Mond, and Zimmer apparently just got up and left and didn't talk to Spielman for the rest of the third round now. No, Ted, you and I have both spent time in the in the military, whatever. We both had bosses, commanders, whatever, that we didn't care for or whatever. But shut up and do your job. Your job is to communicate with the GM. And if he's taking guys that you didn't think or have on your radar as guys that he was going to take, that's a communication problem. That's something y'all had three months between the end of the season and the draft in April to hash all that out. And apparently you didn't do that. And I'm not sure whose fault that is, but I mean, your job is to work with the GM, work with the ownership, work with everybody else in whatever hierarchy you're a part in there and don't bitch about it afterwards. I mean, mistakes were made obviously, but you know, everybody made mistakes, not just one dude or not like everybody, but you. You know, I mean, everyone's at fault there. I had two takeaways from this, and you guys pretty much both hit them. One, Zimmer came off as a guy who thought, you know, it was pretty much everybody's fault but mine. Kevin O'Connell came in, took basically the same roster with a worse defensive coordinator the next year and went 13-4 and four and made the playoffs. Yep. And Rick Spielman didn't care what anybody else, to include his head coach and his coaching staff and his scouting department thought and just went rogue and picked dudes that pretty much nobody else thought he should pick in terms of Kellen Mond, Wyatt Davis, Chaz Surratt. When you have four picks in the third round, you should at least, and and Zimmer had a good point. He said, I didn't like who he picked when I thought there were still starters on the board. And that was a very good point, I thought. I thought probably Zimmer's one of his few good points in that entire article. And he was right. I mean, you, you had a chance to set up your roster for either starters or quality depth dudes that could come in and play at least on the defensive line or linebackers or the secondary, if you're a defensive guy in Zimmer's mind, in a heavy rotational basis, and you whiffed pretty much on all of them. I mean, maybe not Patrick Jones, who's still on the roster. Three of those four third-rounders didn't even make it through their second training camp. Yeah. They all got cut in 2022 when O'Connell took over, except for Jones. I finished reading that article, and I, I thought to myself, it was more than time for both of those guys to go because there was absolutely no relationship whatsoever. Somebody asked Kellen Mond to respond to the article. He said, I, I didn't talk to 
Zimmer one time the entire year. Ridiculous. I, I mean, you know. Come on. And I remember that press conference toward the end of the year, Mon's rookie year or whatever, the, the Vikings had gotten knocked out of the playoffs in Green Bay or whatever. And the reporter going into the last week of the season, he says, uh, do you think you're going to get a chance to see Kellen Mond in action next week? And he just said, no. Do you think you want to get a look at Mond next week? Not particularly. I see him every day. What the hell else did they have to play for at that point? He was just that adamant that he wasn't going to give that dude a shot. He's like, no, we're out of the playoffs. We got nothing to play for. But I'm, I'm still not going to play this dude to hell with it. So, yeah. so, I don't know. Ted, do you remember the Good Morning Gallahorn days with David Stefano? I do. Very much. Fondly. Quite fondly. We were talking about this a year, a year and a half before all of this happened. We were talking we were. about the dysfunction. You and I. Dysfunction yep. between Spielman and Zimmer. Zimmer was blaming people back then, and I was getting in arguments with David Stefano back then. Yeah. After that Dallas game we had, and I was saying, you got to get better. He was saying he's not responsible. He is responsible. You're El Capitano. You're the head coach. I'm El Capitano. There was something off in that locker room after the 2017 season. We sensed it, and it just got worse and worse and worse as the years went on. And, you know, I don't want to use it as an excuse, but I think the Bridgewater injury really did a number on Zimmer because we heard the way he talked about Teddy Bridgewater. He treated him like a son or whatever, and then all of a sudden he has the disaster injury. And, you know, even in 2017, when Case Keenum was out there taking the Vikings to a 13-3 and record, he never really fully committed to Case Keenum. I mean, he, he had that one week in that Monday night game against Chicago where they decided they were going to throw Sam Bradford out there. After about three snaps, it was pretty clear that Bradford wasn't ready to be out there again. So they had to go back to Keenum in the second half, and they just kept winning football games, and he still wouldn't commit to the guy. I remember in 2017, I can remember only one time where Zimmer gave Keenum a postgame compliment, and he said, Case has balls, I'll give him that. Because it, it felt like he was waiting for Keenum to just make a mistake so he could put Bridgewater back in. That mistake never really came. No. Because Keenum, to his credit, played really good football until that NFC Championship game in Philadelphia. And by then it was too late. I mean, it just yeah. it just didn't matter. So, uh, yeah, it was just weird. And then the, the signing of, of Cousins caused this bigger fracture. And then and, and, and Zimmer mentioned that. He said, you know, we've won more than 10 games with quarterbacks not as good as Kirk or something like that. Some and now you line. want to spend all this money on, on one quarterback where – we could spend it on defense or something like that. I think that's, I don't think it was Kirk specifically. I think it was just that decision to invest that much money in a quarterback. And it just, it just went to hell from there. But anyways, enough, enough of that. All right. Yeah. Zimmer, he's a defensive coordinator. He's not a head coach. I said that from the beginning. Yeah. He got stuck with Spielman. I think it's unfair because Spielman was terrible. When he got fired, Zimmer, I said, if you don't fire Spielman too with Zimmer, you might as well keep Zimmer because Spielman's as much of a problem as Zimmer is. They were both very much to blame at the very end. And we talked about, you know, the Vikings had lost that playoff game. You remember in 2019 the when they game. the Saints? Yeah. yeah, everybody thought the Vikings were going to get blown out of the Superdome, but they, they won. And the speculation was that the Vikings lost that game. Zimmer was out of a job. Right. And I, I think if the Vikings had lost that game, they would have fired Zimmer but kept Spielman. And in retrospect, I'm glad they won that game because it became apparent that both those guys should have should have been canned. So, whatever. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Rabbit W. Fondroth here. The 2024 season begins anew. The Minnesota Vikings take the Long Island Lolita on the butt of Buco Express to take on Danny Dines, Brian Dable, and the dastardly New York Giants. Will they come out 1-0 and or 0-1? We find out. Thank you, Robert. That was great. Nick had to run out. He had to go save the president. He's only got an hour. (laughs) That charge is going to (laughs) explode. All right. So this week, the Vikings start off their season on what I think is probably the most winnable game in their early part of their schedule. It's it's a road game at the burial grounds, allegedly, of uh, Jimmy Hoffa. (laughs) They travel the New York football giants. So last year, the giants weren't very good. Uh, Neither were the Vikings. And both teams have had a fairly significant makeover. All right, so Ruby's put up our big board, the triumvirate big board, as we're going to call it this year. We've got the the categories are back. We start with quarterbacks, and we finish 
with my favorite category, Drew. What is that? Intangibles. Intangibles. It's stuff you can't see, son. It's just stuff you can't see. Hey, Chris, this is your first big board. You ready for this? I, I'm certainly going to try. I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not Jimmy the Greek or Brent Musburger, but I can. Uh, and I'm certainly not Phyllis George. But that's your. You're not Ox Baker either. Uh, definitely not. He he has much better hair than I do. So as as Chris referenced, uh, Jimmy the Greek and Brent Musburger. This is our tribute to, uh, when Drew and I started this show. If you're if you're kind of new, our favorite pregame show back in the day was uh, the NFL Today pregame show with Brent Musburger, Phyllis yes. George, or Cross. Mm, Phyllis, Phyllis, Phyllis. Yeah, yeah. And so this is kind of our our modified tribute to that when Brent and Jimmy the Greek Snyder would get up and talk and and. They couldn't talk about gambling back in the day. They, that's all they do now is talk about gambling. But <laughs> every about every third game, Brent Musburger would say, so great, you think uh, the Falcons are three and a half better than Philadelphia today or not? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, all right. So we'll start with quarterbacks. You know, I would argue both quarterbacks have a lot to prove. We got uh, slinging Sammy Dots for the Minnesota Vikings against Danny Dimes. You know, a lot of this – Quarterback performance to me relies on how well the offensive line protects, the receivers you're throwing to, and the running game. And we've talked about this all offseason, both Drew and Chris, that Sam Donald's been in the best spot he's ever been in. If he's ever going to succeed, it will be in this offense in this season. So for me, I'm going to give Sam Darnold the advantage here. Chris, what about you? I hate to do this for my very first pick ever on this, but I'm going to have to go with more of a, uh, a push here. Both of these guys have quite a bit to prove. Daniel Jones only played six games last year. He tore his ACL. And he's on the comeback from that. In the six games he played, he only threw two touchdown passes. He's got that big contract extension that he's got to finally live up to. And, you know, we've talked about Sam Darnold and all the talent around him. And since we are in New York, we can say that with deference to uh, Frank Sinatra, if Sam Darnold can't make it there, he can't make it anywhere. <laughs> so... Uh, both these guys got something to prove, and I, I really can't give an advantage to one or the other at this point, so I'm going to go with the push here. Okay. Drew. The Sam Darnold's big problem has been in the NFL. I was looking back on tape at him today and some of his stats. He's had 63 touchdown passes, Ted, 56 interceptions. That is just horrible. It is. In this day and age, it is. If this was 1975, that'd be good numbers. Yeah, no, I know. In first year, he threw 19 touchdowns and 17 picks. If you have 63 career touchdowns, you should have about 15 interceptions. I mean, I know he hasn't been on good teams, but that is his problem. The avalanche starts after he starts throwing these picks. He loses his confidence. He's not really been on teams that come back. Either one of these guys seem like they melted down a lot in the past. I had a hard time choosing. I was right along the lines with Chris of being a push. But I did the Drew thing and said, if I'm playing playground football and I need a quarterback, who am I taking? Daniel frickin' Jones or Big Hair Darnold or slang, slinging Sammy Darts, <laughs> as you call him. I'm probably taking Darnold. Okay. So I'm going to go that route. And I know one important thing that you mentioned, you got to factor in the receivers. You got to factor in the D-line. You got to factor in your O-line, your pass blocking. That all factors into what kind of grade you're going to go for the quarterback. All these grades tonight, Ted, are going to be kind of guessing because we haven't had any games yet. Yep. So we can't really com – numbers are kind of out the window. But quarterback-wise, I'm going to give it to the Vikings. But at the end summary, I kind of know how this game's going to play out. So we'll talk about that at the end of it. All right. So running game. Chris, you can start off. So big change for the Giants this year. They lost their bell cow back. Saquon Barkley, he signed with the Philadelphia Eagles. It looks like on their depth chart, according to ESPN, Devin Singletary is their number one guy backed up by Tyrone Tracy, who looks to be questionable right now, along with Eric Gray. Again, Vikings have a, a new running back as well with uh, Aaron Jones, backed up by Ty Chandler. Who, who do you got for the running game for this one? Yeah, I think this one's got to lean toward the Vikings. I mean, like, like we've said, uh, the offensive line for this team is pretty solid. Aaron Jones should be a significant step up from Alexander Madison. Ty Chandler has proven himself to be more than capable. As nice a back as Devin Singletary is, he's not Saquon Barkley. He's not on that level or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that the running game, which was pretty terrible for the Vikings for most of last year, is going to be significantly approved this season. And I think it starts today or on Sunday, rather, against, uh, against the Giants. Drew? Singletary is no slouch. He's a career 4.6 average guy. 
He's not a burner, Ted, as you look. 888 carries. His longest run is 50 yards. So he's not going to beat you on the big chunk stuff. But what he does is he wears down a defense. He's a pretty good back. He's better than average. But they really have no depth at running back. They got him. They got Gray, the draft pick out of fifth-round guy of Oklahoma, who I really like. I think Gray is probably better than Singletary. He just hasn't proven himself right now. I think in the long run, Gray's going to be the guy there. If the Vikings control the run. I think they control this game big time. Singletary's a capable three-down back, but you got to give the Vikings the edge in the running game with, with Chandler and Jones. I mean, come on. Yeah, I agree with you guys. Last year, the Vikings were 29th in the NFL running the ball, but that was with Alexander Madison as their lead back for a vast majority of the season. When Ty Chandler came in and started the last, what, three or four games of the year, I think it was, they had significant improvement. You add Aaron Jones in free agency with Ty Chandler backing him up. I think that's a significant advantage for the Vikings. I give the Vikings a check mark there. Bam. Drew, tell us about the receiving game. Tell you about that Malik Neighbors guy. If you let him run free, totally lessening your chances of winning because that guy's the real deal. I watched him in two preseason games, and he looks like a man among boys out there, a man among kids. He is a great, great wide receiver. I mean, we did draft right up on him here at Vikings Report. During the uh, offseason, you need to cover him or he's going to ruin your day. The other guy, uh, Slayton, he's 63 years old. He can't see anymore. <laughs> I don't care much about him. Wandale Robinson, 60 catches last year, Ted, but only 525 yards. The three starting wide receivers only had five touchdowns for the Giants. Nine TD catches between six wide receivers. Maybe that's because of Saquon Barkley. I don't know. But I still got to give it to the Vikings, even if Addison doesn't start. I think Addison's going to play. There's no Darren Waller, even though they replace him with the other tight end. Bellinger's a pretty good player. I think the tight end kind of washes each other out. I'm going to give the receiving core of the Vikings the uh, check mark today with the helmet. Yeah, I am too. I, I think Malik Neighbors is a real deal. Uh, in the draft, the Vikings were concerned. The Giants, might, who are picking ahead of the Minnesota might pick J.J. McCarthy. I think the, the Giants were picking sixth, I believe. They picked Malik Neighbors, cleared the path for the Vikings to pick McCarthy. I think Malik Neighbors is going to be a, a serious threat. Wandale Robinson, I think, is a, is a pretty good player. Again, Darius Slayton can start drawing on his 401K. Although the last time we saw Darius Slayton, he was running wild in the secondary in that playoff loss to the Giants a yeah, few years ago. he was. Golly. But you look at Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, Jalen Naylor had an excellent preseason, I thought. And Tristan Jackson just impressed the heck out of me in the preseason. I think the Vikings one through four in the receiver group is going to be really good. I, I like the tight end group, but I'm not sold on them yet. I think they still have something to prove. Josh Oliver I, it looks like tight end number one right now. Hopefully it won't come down to that when you have Jefferson, Addison, Naylor, and, and Tristan Jackson. So I'm going with the Vikings there. Chris, what about you? The Minnesota Vikings have Justin Jefferson and the New York Giants do not. Uh, <laughs> Hashtag analysis. Uh, I will give it to uh, the Vikings. On this oh, I one. love it. Don't really need to say a whole lot more than that. The Vikings receiving group is uh, significantly better than the Giants group. So for the O-line, Christian Derrissaw, Blake Brandle, Garrett Bradbury, Ed Ingram, Brian O'Neill for the Vikings. The Giants have Andrew Thomas, John Runyon, who right now is questionable. John Michael Schmitz, no relation to John Michael Montgomery, the great country music singer. Greg Van Roten and Jermaine El Munior. The Giants offensive line last year was one of the worst of the NFL. They were actually worse than the Vikings offensive line. And I'm going Vikings, and that's not saying a whole lot. The one question mark I have with the Vikings, again, is the interior offensive line. I, I just was not sold on taking a tackle in Blake Randall and moving the interior offensive line. I, I complained about it all offseason. The Vikings kind of have a recent history of doing this, and it doesn't work out a whole lot. But I'm going to take the Vikings offensive line because in the preseason, the Vikings quarterbacks had a pretty good ability to move and climb the pocket, which Kirk didn't really do a whole lot. So I think that's going to help the offensive line look better. So that's why I'm going with the Vikings offensive line. Drew? I'm giving the Giants the edge here. Okay. I think the Giants have a pretty good offensive line. I think besides their three down linemen on the defense, I think it's the strongest part of their team. Andrew Thomas, that guy's a hell of a player. And the guys you mentioned earlier, I think the Vikings O-line is weak in the area that the Giants are best, the middle of that defensive line. And we'll talk about Dexter Lawrence yeah. in a minute, but it's pretty close. I think the Giants are a little bit more stout inside, Ted, the inside offensive line. I mean, I think the Vikings have them at tackle, but to a man, I gave the Giants a nod on the offensive line. I know they were terrible last year, but they've 
sign some guys here. Andrew Thomas, Runyon, he's a good player. I just kind of feel that they have the okay. advantage. Chris? I think I'm going to have to give the slight edge to the Vikings here. I mean, I know you exp- expressed concern with the interior of the offensive line, and like Drew said, we're going to get into uh, the Dexter Lawrence and the boys here in a little bit, but that dude has the potential to uh, ruin your Sunday all yeah. by himself. And uh, with the Vikings still having issues on the interior, I just think their tackles are significantly better than the Giants' tackles, and the Giants aren't enough better, or better enough, I should say, on the interior to to make up that difference. So it's a slight edge to the Vikings, but it's still an edge. All right, Chris, start us off on the front seven. So, yeah, we, we mentioned Dexter Lawrence, quite possibly the most underrated defensive lineman in the league. That dude wrecks a lot of offenses all by himself. Uh, they've got Kayvon Thibodeau, who's shown himself to be more than capable. The Vikings have added a lot of folks in the front seven. Uh, they've added you know, Blake Cashman, Andrew Van Ginkle, Jonathan Grenard to the linebacker group. Yeah, we talked last week about the uh, the younger guys kind of backing up the veterans on the defensive line. Yeah, I, I just think the Giants have the advantage uh, in the front seven here, largely because of uh, Lawrence and Thibodeau, and we just haven't seen how these new faces for the Vikings are going to uh, function together yet. So I got to get the Giants the edge there. Drew, both teams run the 3-4. I spent two or three hours breaking down these two uh, areas of each team. It was close. The Giants clearly have the better three-down linemen, Ted, with Lawrence and, you know, Nunez compared to what the Vikings have. I think the Vikings have an advantage at inside linebacker, maybe not at outside linebacker because they got Brian Burns, who they overpaid for, but they got him. They got Burns and they got Thibodeau rushing off the edge like the Vikings do with Dallas Turner. I just think they're so much better on the defensive line with those three down linemen that I had to give them the slight edge to it. But I do think the Vikings are better at middle linebacker. I do. Back when we first started doing this show, we had, instead of the front seven, we had defensive line and linebackers. And if we still did that, I would give the defensive line edge to to the Giants, and I would give the linebacking edge to the Vikings. But since we do it this way, you know, the the Giants got Brian Burns for a song from Carolina in the offseason, comparatively speaking. And you guys are right. If you could put the Giants' defensive line on Minnesota – and, right. and the Minnesota could keep their linebacking core. It'd be the best front seven in football, I think. The Achilles seal for the Vikings defense is going to be that defensive line. I like, Chris, what you said with the additions of, of Grenard, Cashman, Van Ginkle, Dallas Turner. But is it going to be enough to overcome that defensive line? And I think the Giants have enough talent spread out among the, the defensive line and the linebacking core that give them just a slight edge. Like you guys, I'm going to have to give that to the Giants as well. But not my bunch. Drew, talk to us about the secondary. You know, the Xavier McKinney, losing him for the Giants, I think is a lot better than what people are talking about. That is a big loss for the Giants. They have going new safeties there. I think getting Adoree Jackson re-signed, which they recently did, pushes uh, Flott back out to nickel because he's a nickel corner, but they had him lined up as playing the starting outside corner until Adoree Jackson got figured out, and now he's back. So I think they're really going to struggle at safety dealing with Addison and Jefferson. I mean, McKinney was a really, really solid guy back there. He was the coach of the defense, and I think losing him is a big deal. And flat out with Gilmore, when you look at player to player, I like the Vikings secondary in this game. And the ability of Daniel Jones to uh, melt down, I give the Vikings the edge. It looks like their secondary has struggled. And I watched a Giants podcast, and one of the things they talked about the areas they're worried about with against the Vikings, Ted, was the secondary because their secondary is the weakest part of their team. So I'm going to give the Vikings the edge on the secondary. Yeah, I agree with you, Drew. I like the secondary as well. We were all concerned about it during the offseason, but then they signed Gilmore right at the very end of training camp. When you look at the Vikings secondary now, it's something that kind of you're like, wow, that potentially be a strength of the unit with Shaq Griffin starting with Gilmore, and then you got Bynum and Harrison Smith, and then superstar kind of plays everywhere guy, Josh Metellus. I like the, the potential that this unit has for the first time in several seasons. I mean, it was a weak spot for a long time, and now it looks tight, like it could potentially be a real strength of this unit. So I'm, I'm going with the secondary as well, uh, for the Vikings as well. I kind of agree. The Vikings group of safeties is one of the best in the league, if not the best, with uh, Bynum and Metellus and Harrison Smith. And uh, they really did themselves uh, – a positive with the Gilmore signing and the Shaq Griffin signing and Byron Murphy continuing to be solid. He's back healthy after that injury he had at the end of last year. 
So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give this one to the Vikings, too, I think. All right, red zone. I don't think either team was really particularly good in the red zone last year. I didn't bother to look it up because both teams were bad, so I didn't really care, and it's a new year anyways. When you look at the weapons Minnesota has, the improvement in the running game, the receivers that Sam Darnold has to throw to, the weak secondary that the Giants have, if the Minnesota Vikings can give Sam Darnold just enough time to give him time to throw the ball, I'm going to give the Vikings the edge here in the red zone. Chris? Yeah, I I tend to agree. I mean, obviously, if the Vikings had TJ Hawkinson, this would be an easy choice uh, for the red zone, but unfortunately, they don't. The tight ends the Vikings have don't have quite the uh, cachet that Hawkinson has. But, you know, like we said, when you have Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison and uh, the improvement in the run game, I, I think it's going to work out well in the red zone for the Vikings when they get down there. So I will give Minnesota the advantage here. You know, it's hard to call red zone stuff the first game of the season. That's yeah, a, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, really. Everybody has a different red zone attack every season. So you have to kind of wait two or three weeks where you can really categorize this as who has the advantage. But I'm going to say, without Saquon Barkley and Darren Waller, I'm going to give it to the Vikings because I think those were two red zone weapons that the Giants had. So you take them away, factor in everything Chris Gates said, I'm giving the red zone to the Vikings, both offensively, and defensively, Vikings get my red zone pick. Special teams. Chris, what are your thoughts on the special teams between the Giants? Uh, and the Giants? I am going to lean towards the Giants in this one just simply because of the uh, experience that the Giants have. I mean, they've got Graham Gano as a kicker. He's been in the league forever. And uh, the punter, they've got uh, the Scottish Hammer in Jamie Gillian. <laughs> he, uh, he's been around for uh, for quite a while as well. And I know we all love Will Reichert. I love Will Reichert. I think he's hopefully going to be uh, the guy that kind of does away with this kicker curse that the Vikings have had since, like, forever. But, you know, this is his first NFL game. Uh, Ryan Wright really struggled last year, so I can't really say we can rely on him at this point. So just because of the experience that the, uh, the Giants have uh, on the special teams, I think I'm going to have to give them the advantage there. Drew? Nothing to add. That's right where I'm at. Okay. Will will reign for a thousand year Reichard. So how's that? How's that? <laughs> how's that? Grab your Vermont. The punt returner and the kick returner for the Giants for ESPN is uh, well, Gunnar Olszewski. Yeah, he's hurt. Yeah, and what did Germany do to Poland? But he's I'm just asking. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying. Just saying. <laughs> I'm changing my pick. I'm changing my pick. <laughs> Look, at some point, you've got to put faith <laughs> in a Minnesota Vikings kicker. Why not here? Why not now? All right, Drew, tell me about coaching. Who do you like in this? I like O'Connell if he could stay aggressive. Both guys made that wild card game a couple years ago, Ted. Mm -hmm. And then both their seasons last year were in the toilet, brother. So they're both bouncing back. I think they're both good head coaches. But we talk about coaching. We talk about the whole staff. That's what this includes, not just the head coach. And I think the Vikings have the advantage of defensive coordinator. I'm going to give the slight edge to the Vikings. But if Kevin O'Connell comes out and he's running the ball on second and 10 every, you know, it's going to be a long day. But I'm going to give O'Connell the nod right here. Chris, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to have to lean toward the Vikings as well. They have a little more continuity. Uh, on the coaching staff, they've got their uh, head coach and all three of their coordinators returning for the first time in forever. I think it's been nine or ten years since they've been able to say that. They've always lost a, a coordinator or a coach over the course of that time. The Giants said farewell to uh, their old defensive coordinator, Wink Martindale, who was uh, highly regarded. I'm not even sure who's replaced him at this point. Where'd he um, go? Where'd he go? I, I think he just retired. Ah, um, he's at Michigan. Oh. No, he's at Michigan. That's right. Yeah, he is. He could just as well have retired. Um, so hey. looking at, uh, on, oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? My bad. Um, <laughs> they do have, uh, they do have former Vikings defensive line coach Andre Patterson uh, on the staff coaching defensive line over there. But uh, I don't think that's going to be enough. I just like the Vikings coaching staff better. Yeah, I do too. You talk about the Vikings losing players. Both teams lost key players on both sides of the ball, but I think the Vikings did a better job of replacing those players overall the one area where the vikings probably downgraded would be a quarterback but it's still a push when you look at the giants quarterback because they still have daniel jones and i i think donald's at least a push jones compared to you know losing cousins over 2023 i think it's a big year for both coaches 
Dable was probably going to be on a hot seat next year if they don't do very well because they extended Daniel Jones and they kept Daniel Jones. They didn't kind of move on, whereas I think the Vikings, Kevin O'Connell is going to have at least one or two more years of kind of a, a cold seat because they got McCarthy and they get to work with him now that he's on IR. I'm going to go with the Vikings as well. So intangibles. You guys talked about the, the Giants defense a lot better than I did. I, I remember last year before the, the Vikings week one game against Tampa Bay, I, I said if the Vikings were going to lose that game, it was going to be because the Vikings offensive line could not control the Buccaneers defensive line. And I, I look at this very similarly. And they had problems with, by the way, he wreaked havoc uh, against the Vikings all afternoon. Whole defensive line did, and the Vikings struggled, and they lost. And I, I look at this very much the same way. That Giants front seven is pretty good. And if the Vikings cannot keep them off balance in terms of having a good mix of running the ball and throwing the ball, Sam Darnold might start seeing ghosts like he had famously said when he's with the Jets, I believe. Uh, and it could be a long day for the Vikings. Now, that is my big intangible for this game. Other than that, they got to get Aaron Jones going and they got to find Justin Jefferson early and often. And if they can do that, I think it's going to be a good day. So who do you give the edge to in the uh, intangible um, category? I'm going to give a little bit of an edge here to the Vikings, but not much. Tunes, can you take away both helmets? There's no intangible edge for either team. Both teams got a quarterback that can melt down. Nothing weird going on. The weather, 17% chance of rain, 72 degrees. We always give the weather here at Vikings Report. A 17% chance of showers. The wind is 10 miles an hour. The northwest won't be a difference, but I don't see anybody having an advantage here. Okay. No, I mean, it's, it's kind of early in the season. You know, there's really no momentum established yet. I mean, if you want to look at which team had the better off season, uh, I think the Vikings had a better off season than the Giants did. But yeah, I mean, the Giants are at home. The Vikings have a new quarterback, a lot of new faces on defense. We got to see how everything melts together. Uh, I'm going to finish this one the way I started, and I'm going to go with a uh, push in the intangibles category because there's, there's really no way to... Uh, to establish who's got any sort of momentum at this point. So it's basically even for me. Fair. Take the Vikings helmet off the board for me too, Ruby. You guys talk <laughs> me into it. You're right. There's no way to determine. The Giants, they're not very good. They didn't improve a lot from last year. They got Burns. They got Neighbors. That team has no reason to be beating the Vikings. The Vikings are, have more talent. When you look at the rosters, I compared both today. The Vikings right down the board have more talent. That being said, and Ted, you mentioned this about that Tampa Bay game. Kevin O'Connell has to know that they started at home against Tampa Bay. They should have won that game. It's the same situation. They were more talented on the roster. The Vikings imploded. They had weak play calling on offense, and they lost the game. And Jay Ward jumped off sides and gave Tampa Bay a touchdown. That's one of the games they gave away, in my opinion. So you got to go into this season with that first game in the same situation. I look at the Giants like I look at the Buccaneers. The Vikings, the only way they lose this game is if they beat themselves. And it's really only one way to attack. If the Vikings control the Giants' defensive line, and if the Vikings can run the football, they're going to win. If they let Thibodeau and Burns and Lawrence go off and control that line of scrimmage and control Darnold, the Vikings will not win this game. Kevin O'Connell should be practicing situation football right now where that is the main concern. Because every other area, the Vikings got it covered. But if Darnold gets in trouble, has no time to pass, three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out, they're not going to win. Well, even though the Giants are pretty weak everywhere else, they have that D-line, they have that front seven. You've got to stop that area and defensively i'm not worried brian flores he's coming out now he's going to be able to disguise everything i don't think jones is ready for a flores defense there's going to be 10 man fronts 11 man fronts guys coming from all directions i think jones is going to have a horrible day but the giants can counteract that by being up in darnold's grill and making this a 13 to 10 game in the fourth quarter the Vikings have to stay aggressive. They have to run the football. They have to stop Dexter Lawrence. And they have to be aggressive on offense. I'm going to give you two numbers. Minus 12, plus 12. Minus 12 was the Vikings turnover margin last year. Plus 12 was the Giants turnover margin last year. If the Vikings turn over the ball at the rate they did last season, they're going to lose the football game. Plain and simple. They could not hold on to the football for a vast majority of the year last year. 
And that right. cost them, I would argue, probably four or five football games to include that opener against Tampa Bay. If you turn the ball over in the red zone, you're going to lose football games. And the Vikings cannot do that. They've got to hold on to the football and they've got to score points and be more aggressive. I agree. Chris? No, I, I really agree with Ted. We saw at the beginning of last season, you know, the first four or five games, the Vikings couldn't hold on to the football. Uh, they turned the ball over on the first drive of the game a bunch of times. They had a bunch of turnovers in the first half of a bunch of those games. They started out one and four. And you could argue that four of those, they could have just as easily have been four and one as yeah. one and four in those first five games if they could have just held on to the damn football. And Drew had it right. When you look at these two teams on paper, the Vikings are the better and more talented football team. But if you keep turning the ball over, mistakes on offense, mistakes on special teams are the way to let bad teams hang around and eventually win games that they have no business winning. So the Vikings need to take care of the football. That is the primary objective uh, for this game for the Vikings is to not turn the ball over. If they're careful with the football, if they don't, turn the ball over two or three times if they can force a few turnovers on their end, they should win this football game. You have to mix that aggression in with, you know, taking care of the football. Like Drew said, you can do both, and the Vikings have to do both. You just can't be turning the ball over a bunch of times like we saw them do for most of last year. All right. No trivia tonight. No post game show on Sunday after the game. We'll, we will be back next week for our week two preview. So, for the Duke of Minneapolis, for Snake Pliskin, I'm the brain. Don't call me Harold. A number one, baby. A and number for Maggie, one. Maggie, Tootses, we'll see you guys next week. Studio Ted, we're back. <laughs> but <a> Fuco. <laughs> nice. We are back. Thank you.